Well, that's the theory. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out in practice. Oh, oh I'm terribly sorry. The MG3. Designed in Britain, partially built in China, and newly facelifted for 2018. Should you care? Let's find out. MG, let's go. We'll never be the same And on the screens of our lives flash Words of good songs that we've not yet sung And we're not worried about the future. So what's up with the MG3? As many of you know, MG is a company with quite a turbulent history. In 2005, its predecessor, MG Rover, went bankrupt and their assets were sold to a Chinese firm. Back in 2011, they launched um, an almost all new model, the MG6, which was a complete and utter sales disaster. Absolute disaster. The MG3 itself was launched in 2013, and there's absolutely nothing to do with any previous MG or Rover model, apart from the oil filler cap, which is the same as that on the Rover 45. The model range of the MG3 at launch was very simple. There was the three time, £8,400. A very basic car that didn't even have remote control central locking. There was the three form, which had alloy wheels and a few other things. And then the three form sport, which looked a bit better, had some sportier styling. And then the three style, which is one of these. If you really wanted the ultimate luxury though, you went for the Style Lux, which has leather seats and a few other optional extras. In terms of engines, it's pretty simple. There's just one. It's a 1.5, four-cylinder, with twin overhead cams, variable valve timing, and 16 valves. That might sound quite impressive, but you've got to bear in mind that all engines pretty much are like that now, and they were in the 1990s. One thing this engine really lacks is a turbocharger. All that its main rivals from Hyundai, Kia, Volkswagen, Ford and General Motors would put a one litre, three cylinder turbo engine in this car, which would get much better economy and better low down power. But MG won't do that. Consequently, the fuel figures are not impressive in this car. They're about 20% down on most of it's more conventional rivals. The power output at 105 brake horsepower might sound impressive, but you really have to work the engine very hard to get that. Now this does kind of fit with the character of an MG, you drive it a little bit like a hot hatch, but it does mean that you're going to be visiting the petrol station far too often. As a couple of people have pointed out, this car's got quite a high second gear, and in fact it's possible to reach 60 miles an hour in second gear, which explains why this car's got a 0 to 60 time of 10.5 seconds. So it's reasonably fast if you push it. The economy's not amazing, but it, it'll do. And actually, this car's one of the cheapest ones to insure for young drivers. All models in a range of Group 4 out of 50. Whereas comparable models would probably be at least five to six groups higher. The MG3 is a very good value car, but one has to be careful about looking at the whole picture in terms of running costs. If you're in town as we are now, you'll notice that the car has got a very, very firm ride. This actually has caused problems today when we've been filming. It does give the car, though, this sporty little edge, and it really is sort of reminiscent of the old MG Metro, which also had this kind of firm ride, and um, 
you know, this very sporting character, which is absolutely consistent with the MG name. However, this means the car can be quite uncomfortable if you're going over a lot of urban potholes. Is there a trade-off to this? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> the MG3 has got hydraulic power steering, which is very old-fashioned technology now. Most cars have electric power steering to save a few grams per kilometre of CO2 on the um, combined fuel economy cycles. But this doesn't. This means the steering's a bit heavier for parking than usual. But my goodness, it has feel, it has accuracy, and it's really, really good fun to drive. It's an absolute pleasure to pilot this around some good B roads. Well, that was a lot of fun. Let's look now at some of the more practical aspects of this car. And as always, let's start at the rear. The MG3 is supposed to be a city car by pricing. And yet, if you look in this boot, it's got 280 litres of space. Now, in the city car class, this will be by far the biggest, but it's actually about 10 litres different from the Fiesta and the Corsa. Because of this, I think this is actually a super mini car. There's this very, very large load lip, but that's the path of the course, really. If you look underneath this boot carpet, you'll see that the spare wheel isn't there. This is one of the problems of modern cars and the fuel economy testing procedures is that it's normally easier to put a tire repair kit into the car than put a full size spare wheel in. But actually, I think that's one optional extra you're definitely going to need. If you take a seat in the back, one of the things that's really good about the MG3 is the amount of space in here. For reference, I'm 5 foot 11. This is my driving position. There's lots of headroom. Knee room's okay. You can put your feet underneath the seats. And this really is not a city car. In fact, this is a, really a large super mini. It's much larger than the last generation Fiesta. It's much larger than the current generation Corsa. Probably about the same as the Ford Car Plus. One thing that's a bit of a problem is that the car's quite narrow and so fitting three people in the back is going to be an issue. Also, there is isofix in here, but the anchors are a little bit difficult to get to. Really though, MG is not about space in the back, and MG is about how it drives. Let's sit in the best seat in the house. MGs have this reputation and have had for years of being driver's cars. And so you'd expect the seat to be really nice. And it is, it's very supportive. I once did a four hour journey without a break in the seat and it was absolutely fine. The cabin's pretty interesting actually. The red highlights round everywhere, like the stitching on the seats, this motif that runs down the center of them, although that's really not to everyone's taste. The red stitching on the gear lever here and on the wheel. It's quite like an MG Metro from the 80s. The floor mats even have this nice red piping around them, although as with any car, the floor mats were an optional extra. If I turn the car on, you can see that actually it even lights up in red around the stereo, which is a really lovely feature. What is perhaps so good is that I know this is a cheap car and even the top model in 2014 only cost £10,000 but some of the fixtures and fittings in here are dreadful, dreadful. The gear lever feels so lightweight that it's like it's going to come off at any moment. 
In fact, the press cars had a different gear lever to stop journalists complaining about it, I think. The controls of the heater are really, really confusing. And for some reason, the rear heated window and central locking buttons are in here too. They're all the same size and it kind of looks interesting when you lit it up, but it's so difficult to operate when you're driving. No car should have ergonomics which are this bad. What's a little bit better and maybe more 21st century is that in this cubby at the top of the dashboard, you can actually charge your phone by USB. And MG even sold a little cradle to put an iPhone in to use it like a sat-nav because at launch, no car came with a built-in sat-nav. This is actually the top style trim. It's got things like parking sensors, cruise control, DAB radio, air conditioning, and even tire pressure monitoring, which is really, really handy. The glove box is one of the biggest of any car I've ever seen. And it's wonderful for keeping secret mission documents in. Overall, the visibility of the MG3 is really good. You've got little windows in these door pillars, which allow you to actually see where you're going and come out of junctions properly. The pillars at the back are thick, but you do have optional sensors. One thing you really can't see is the front of the car. It slopes away so dramatically, but I think MG really should have thought about putting front sensors in as well as ones on the back. One link that this car does have to the 1980s is that some of the controls are in really strange places. For example, this hazard light switch, it's between the seats next to the handbrake. You don't want a hazard light switch here, maybe here, or if you really want to go 80s like a Mach 2 Fiesta, right there. Why have you put it down here? I really don't know. So then, in conclusion, what can we say about the MG3? Well, it's interesting to see that throughout the 2010s, MG sales have been increasing year upon year. They started in 2011 with hundreds of sales a year, and now they're in the thousands. They're one of the biggest growing brands that actually exists on the market. So for somebody in the 1980s, perhaps, you bought a Metro or Fiesta or a Nova if you wanted a cheap runaround with a bit of fun. What do you do now? Well, you can either buy a Dutchess Sandero or you can buy one of these. The prices started when these cars were new at £8,400 and rose only to £10,000. On the second-hand market, a car like this is only going to cost you between four pounds and £5,000. And a choice between a Dutchess Sandero and this, I think I'd take one of these, to be honest. Oh, <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, I've got another call, excuse me. Yes, a parrot that speaks Greek. Reply box. Number, welcome to the Lloyd Vehicle Consulting YouTube channel. My name's Joseph Lloyd and I'm an independent vehicle consultant. This is where we do the famous tweed jacket reviews. So if you like this channel and you wish for me to source a vehicle for you, please visit my website at www.lloydvehicleconsulting.co.uk and don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel too, if you wish. Thank you.